Here we go. That happened again and again and again throughout the revolution. That happened again and again and again throughout the establishment of the Constitution. George Washington called the Constitution a standing miracle, as did Madison, one of the principal drafters of the Constitution. Nothing short of a standing miracle that they were able to come together and do what they did. Washington said this, I am sure there never was a people who had more reason to, to acknowledge a divine interposition in their affairs than those of the United States. And I should be pained to believe that they have forgotten that agency, which was so often manifested during our revolution, or that they failed to consider the omnipotence of that God who was alone able to protect them. That was the starting point of a nation that never should have been. When they established the Constitution and realizing what they were up against, what they had, had, had dealt with, there were three very fundamental principles that they, that they considered that were the foundations of what they did. The first was they knew it was the nature and disposition of men and governments to amass unbridled power. When we look at what hap what's happening today, it's nothing more than a natural law. It is the nature and disposition of men and governments to amass unbridled power. Our government is doing what governments do, what governments have done throughout history. Understanding that, realizing that, they did some very important things. But let me first talk about the other two fundamentals that were the establishment of our government. Number one was our rights come from God, not from a government and certainly not from a court. Powers to government come from the people. Again, not from a government and certainly not from a court. Those were the fundamentals. So realizing that it's the nature and disposition of men and government to amass unbridled power, so we've got to do something about that, right? You know what it is. We learned about it in eighth grade, eighth grade civics, right? So we've got to have this checks and balances. Have you had this lesson yet in school? Checks and balances, you know what they are? You know what they are. What are they? Checks and balances where they make sure the government, um, their power, their checks and balances, um, so that they have the three branches of government, so that um, one government keeps one in line, so that no one gets more power. Nice. Listen to this young man. Gold star for you tonight, okay? What do we call that? What do we call that? Separation of powers, right? Separation of powers. We've got executive, legislative, judicial. Period, the end, right? But in eighth grade civics, that's all we learned. And in high school history, that's all we learned. And even in college history, that's all we learned. And even in law school, that's all we learn. Think about the founding that God had a hand in founding this nation. I believe that with all my heart. If God had a hand in founding this nation, does it not stand to reason that his enemy would be equally as interested in thwarting the work that God did for the spread of freedom throughout the world? You've talked a lot about education. I wonder why it is that that's all we study in eighth grade civics. That that's all we study in high school and college and law school history. But that's pretty much it. But that's not what Madison told us. Again, he knew a thing or two about the Constitution. Madison said in a single republic, you have this separation of powers. And, and the government controls itself by the different, different branches. But in the compound republic of America, however, the power is first divided among two distinct governments and they will control each other. And there was a very important reason. He said, thus providing a double security to the rights of the people. Alexander Hamilton, again, the big government guy, Alexander Hamilton says, this balance of power between the federal and state governments is of the utmost importance. The two governments, a certain rivalship will ever subsist between them, preventing the other from overpassing their constitutional limits. When I was in the campaign and we're going door to door and working on these things, and God, it's one of the hardest things I think I've ever done. We got close and, 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 and we're, we're, as a family, we're studying this Constitution. We got to Article 6. And in, I mean, here we're just about, the election's just about upon us. We get to Article 6 and it says, the members of the several state legislatures 
shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. Now, it makes sense that we swear an oath or affirmation to support the Constitution of the state of Utah, but to support the Constitution of the United States of America as a state legislator. And, and the question just hit me so powerfully. What, what rights do I have? What power do I have? I'm being told that, that I've been told all my life that, that, that if there's a problem with power, if there's a problem in government, I've got to go here. That's where you solve the problem. You've got to go here. They're the ones that determine everything. You've got to go to a few men in black robes and they decide everything. What power do I have then, as a state legislator, to be a control, to, to, to prevent the federal government from overpassing their constitutional limits? Well, that intrigued me tremendously. And so, geeky lawyer fashion, I went out and started researching and looking, what can I find and what is there? And uh, we've come up with a little, little handbook on... Uh, on, on, on what that means. Thomas Jefferson made a statement, well, before we get there, right here, Madison also said, it's not just a balance. He said the powers delegated to the federal government are, you guys know this, right? Few and defined. Those reserved to the states are numerous and indefinite. So it's not this. It's not this. It's that. That's what they told us. And they told us that in the Federalist Papers. That's in Federalist 45. That was the benefit of the bargain. That was the benefit of the bargain. That, 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 those were the writings that they did to convince people, it's okay to do this Constitution. We're going to strengthen this federal government a little bit more. But it's okay because powers in the states, numerous and indefinite, those to the federal government, few and defined, right? Thomas Jefferson described it this way. He said, uh, well, there in just a second. Um, he said, we must strengthen the state governments. We can't do this by any change in the Constitution because it's the mere preservation of the Constitution is all that we need to contend for. It must be done by the states themselves, erecting barriers at the constitutional line, as cannot be surmounted, either by themselves or by the general government. It must be done by the states themselves, erecting barriers at the constitutional line. Well, what is that? Well. Article 1, Section 8, we've got 18 powers. In the rest of the Constitution, there's another 18 powers delegated to Congress. There's a specific section that, that has the delegation of powers to the President. There's another specific section, Article 3, that has a specific delegation of powers to the, Supreme, to the, to the courts. That's it. That's it. And then we have that funny thing, the Tenth Amendment. Powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Do you know why they said it that way, reserved to the states or to the people? They already existed as their own nations. They viewed themselves as separate nations. They already had their own constitutions. And in their own constitutions, they had already allocated separately in their various states the rights they were willing to give to their state, the rights that they reserved to the people. So when we did the Constitution for the United States, anything not delegated to the United States is reserved to the states unless they in their own constitutions reserved it to themselves. That, that, that's what that, that's about. Very, very specific language. Then you have the Ninth Amendment as well. The powers enumerated shall not be construed to deny or disparage others reserved by the people. We kind of skip over that Ninth Amendment. Pretty, pretty critical stuff. I don't think they were prone, as with the oath, as with the... Uh, the, the amendments to the Constitution, I don't think they were prone to just throwing words around. So we look back at that oath, okay? Why is that in there? Think about what they meant. Again, I don't think it was just a mere ceremony. Yeah, I swear to uphold, defend the Constitution of the United States, so help me God, now let's go have lunch. I don't think they were like that. Have any of you ever seen the movie Man for All Seasons? 1966 Academy Award winning movie. Best movie of all time. One of your homework assignments for tonight is to go watch that movie. Um, absolutely best movie of all time. So you know the story, right? Thomas More. Thomas More was a Chancellor of England, very devout Catholic. King Henry VIII had already persuaded the Pope to allow him to get rid of the one wife who couldn't bear him children and marry another one. She couldn't give him children, so now he wanted to get rid of her as well and marry a different. The Pope said, 
I'm not going there. There was a special circumstance for this one. There's not a special circumstance for the other one. And there was a big uproar in England. Can the king do this? Can he not? They started to basically make war with the church. Thomas More was a devout, devout Catholic man. Um, the king eventually came out and, and, and had a loyalty. Well, it wasn't really a loyalty. It was an oath that the king was the supreme head of the church in England. And, and to have public office, you had to swear to this oath. And, and so because of that, Thomas More resigned his office and just said, I'm going to remain silent. In silence is my protection in the law. I'm just going to remain silent. But he was such a devout man, and he was known throughout the country as a devout man, that his silence was deafening. Ultimately, he was put in the Tower of London. Eventually, he was beheaded. But when he was in the Tower of London, um, had lost his servants, lost his, his, his standing, lost his wealth, they had his daughter and his wife come to visit him in the Tower of London. I love this, this movie. is so, oh, it's so great. You've got, you got to see this movie. Um, but she comes to the Tower and she says, Father, God more regards the thoughts of the heart than the words of the mouth, or so you've always told me. He says, that's right. Then say the words of the, of the oath and come out. And he said to her, what is an oath but words we say to God? He says, listen, when a man takes an oath, he's holding him own, his own self in his own hands like water. And if he opens his fingers then, he needn't hope to find himself again. Some men aren't capable of such a thing, but I'd be loath to think your father one of them. I think that's the kind of oath. Those who pledge their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor. I think that's the kind of oath they expected of state legislators because we're supposed to be the external check. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern, external and internal checks would not be necessary. Very critical to who we are, to what we're doing, to the type of government. So are we there? Are we here? Are we living that? Is that, is that, is that? Why is that not happening? Why are we here? Why are we here? Fourteen trillion dollars in debt. You know who LeBron James is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know who LeBron James is, right? You feel sorry for him? Were you crying for him the other day? He took a pay cut. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? The poor guy went from the Cleveland Cavaliers to the Miami Heat, and now he's only making, do you know how much? The poor guy is only making $40 million a year. I think we should take up a collection to help him out. Do you know how long it would, how many seasons it would take LeBron James at $40 million a year to make $1 trillion? I got hundreds of years over here. I got a week. 25,000 seasons. I think I could take him by then. 25,000 years at 40 million a year to make 1 trillion. Our debt is 14 trillion. The unfunded obligations, according to the Dallas Federal Reserve, as of a year ago, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, unfunded, net present value of unfunded obligations is in excess of $100 trillion. Look at this. this. This is the income line. This is revenues to the federal government. These are the expense lines. This is entitlements, interest on the debt, defense spending, non-defense spending spending, discretionary, non-defense discretionary spending. You see what's happening to entitlements, that's what they were talking about earlier. You also see what's happening to interest. Interest is going like that, and then you see the other. Now this is where we are right here. Okay, so here's our revenue, we're coming along like this, we're coming down here. Look what they're projecting. It's just gonna take off like a rocket from here, right? And even if even if it takes off like a rocket, we're still overspending by more than a trillion dollars a year forever. 